Michael Wood Jr. It's good to uh, good to chat to you again, mate. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. It's always good to chat again, and revisit old issues. I think <laughs> times change, uh, situations change, uh, circumstances change, <laughs> and it, it it can send a principled person through for a loop. Yeah, that's a very very diplomatic way of saying what's been happening in the world lately. <laughs> I, w- I was trying. <laughs> <laughs> you did a very good job, man. Um, well, I suppose for for most of our listeners know who you are. Um, most of our listeners um, love the Joe Rogan podcast and, and, and things like that. But for, for everyone that doesn't, perhaps give us a brief introduction of uh, who you are and what you do because both of those things aren't necessarily the same thing. So, Yeah, that's always a good point. I always like the distinguishing between who someone is and what they do. I always hate that. They're like, what do you do? It doesn't define me. Come on. I'm an individual. I'm not defined by what. (laughs) Uh, So uh, I fancy myself as someone who follows principles. Um, So that's the only thing I fancy myself as. For experience wise, um, I grew up in the 90s. Um, kind of a, like a racially blind time period where I thought that, I mean, I still do I think that was, that was a very good time period and very exper- a good experience. That, uh, it's kind of been lost. But I grew up in the 90s. I, I always fantasized about being a cop. I watched cops. I watched Night Riders. I wanted to do good in society. Uh, went into the Marine Corps at 17 because I wasn't proper enough really for college, I didn't think. And as soon as I got out, went into the Baltimore Police Department, where I was a patrol officer. Then I was a what's called a knocker. So for fans of The Wire, uh, they kind of call them knockers on that show. So you'll have an accurate representation of what they are. That's basically plain closed drug cops who jump out of cars and knock heads. That's literally what knockers mean. It means knocking heads. Uh, so a street enforcer. And then I ended up in major cases doing uh, big long-term investigations in drug work and then became a supervisor, started leading various uh, patrol supervisor first in the Eastern District. So that is the wire. I was essentially the boss on that district and then became, got into some other units behind the scenes stuff. And during that time in the police department, I was really trying to focus on uh, our professional flaws. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if, if you can take something from my individual personality that I was bringing into it, uh, I mean, everything is flawed. Everything can be improved. I feel like that's kind of like what we should be doing, finding anything that we do and improving upon that. Yeah. And we weren't really doing that in policing. We weren't improving upon our results. So I kind of, I got focused on what our procedures and policies were, uh, went and got my master's in, uh, business management and IT because I, I saw a big problem with the management and, and the way organizationally things are structured for the police department. One of the craziest things, just as a basic example, is no matter where you are in Australia, uh, most likely your police department is the biggest budget item on your taxpayers' expenses, mm-hmm. is the most vast and broad organization that you pay for as a government, and it is led by a cop. Yeah. With a high school education, most likely. <laughs> so there was a lot of non kind of CEO management principles that I could see. Like basic things, and like in the Marine Corps, you, just basic things of leadership where, like, you develop a spree de corps, you take your things on trainings, you try to probably professionally improve. You, after you do something, you do an after action where you look for any potential flaws with no one's fault, just flaws in the procedurals that you can improve later, later on for everybody else to help save lives. Mm-hmm. None of those things are taking place in the vast majority of policing so i figured all right great you you understand that policing screwed up and a lot of it's organizational what do you do what are you going to do about it so then i went and got a phd in business management focusing exclusively on police management and the issues surviving that and surrounding that put together a nice policing program that I thought worked very well. A lot of our answers are actually found in those business sciences. Uh, Exxon knows how to run their employees really well, and they've documented all these lessons. <laughs> They're out there for everybody. We know how to get employees to do what they want to do, what we want them to do. So I created a whole policing system like that. In the meantime, I had gone around. I got a reputation for being a whistleblower. That's why I was on the Joe Rogan podcast, and that was mainly fueled by the same issues, police denying 
the professional improvement that we needed to, to take. And I was surrounded by a movement five years ago that was also concerned with improving the way police uh, serve their communities. Mm. So I got caught up in the Black Lives Matter movement, talking about police reform, touring the country, speaking to individuals, going almost to every single state and visiting activists from all over, trying to implement and discuss better policing reforms. And five years later, I would say I have not achieved a goddamn thing. And um, (laughs) we have regressed extremely on the topic. That's the quickest way I can do it. (laughs) It's 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 crazy because, uh, you know, you know, last time we spoke, we were talking about these things and 2020 has just been, if you want to talk about, uh, police reform, you know, not necessarily just police brutality, but I, I like the way you're framing these things. Like, Hey, you know, nothing is perfect in life. By definition, we have things that we need to improve upon. That doesn't mean everything's bad and you're specifically bad who I'm pointing the finger at. It just means we could all get better. And I think that's kind of funnily enough, almost ironically from a psychological perspective, how we find purpose and meaning in life is we remain humble. And that, that fight between, where we are and where we could be is actually what makes us feel good and happy and, and, and important people. And it's just so funny that people can take such, such offense to that. And I suppose when it's organizational and it's systematic, you know, some of these kind of terms that are, that are applicable, um, it, it can go against how people see the organization have seen it for so many years. So it's, it's bound to push a, a few buttons, but everything you said there sounds very, very logical at least for me. And it's often counterintuitive. Mm. So that's almost the case with anything involving human beings. It's like, we are such a confusing species that almost the opposite of what makes sense is what is actually effective. (laughs) I mean, if we take something as simple as like Ritalin for kids with ADHD, if I take Ritalin, I'm going to be bouncing off these walls. But if a kid with ADHD takes Ritalin, it does the exact opposite thing. It's totally counterintuitive mm-hmm. that you would give a hyperactive kid a stimulant and it would calm him down. Makes zero sense, right? Well, that's almost everything involving people. And policing is the, the crossroads of civilization and people. It literally is. It's, mm-hmm. it's where those, thing, those two things are meeting. Where is societal order meeting the individual? And this is always going to have problems that we need to continually refine no matter what we're talking about. Now, if we're talking about defunding the police, then you're often talking about create the, the, what seems to be logical ends up being very counterintuitive that if you take away the police, you are for sure going to increase violence and Mm. have bad results. Our society's not ready for that. Things I'm taking a lot of lessons in pragmatism. I think Mm. I, I felt like there was a wave and I, maybe society felt like there was a wave But anything this complex requires a lot of subtle steps that we move towards slowly and slowly. And one of those big reasons is this changes will result in things that are counterintuitive. We will do something thinking we're going to help people Mm -hmm. and it will end up harming them. Um, A big example in America right now is that I will understand, I perfectly understand why Joe Biden gets uh, defensive when people talk to him about his involvement in the 1994 crime bill. Now, this crime bill was objectively, empirically, at the end of the day, harmful for the lower classes of society. Um, The lower classes in, in, in America are disproportionately black, so thus you end up with disproportional enforcement on black people that had negative results for these communities. But Here's the kicker. Those communities asked for this bill Mm -hmm. and this is what they wanted. And I think that that's one of our most prominent examples of how being a victim of something does not give you, give you any kind of education about what that thing is. Mm -hmm. And policing is even more so because most likely if you had a run in and you think policing needs to change, most likely you have been traumatized by the police. 
And that means you're, you're emotionally, physically in a worse place to be making decisions. You're, you're probably the last person that should be making any decisions when it comes to what we're going to do. You're a traumatized person, but your experience is val valuable to the people that can put it together. So I think we've had this, this thing with emotions and counterintuitive things coming in our, to our society. And this is happening right now in front of our face again, as these very activists are again, arguing for essentially the 1994 crime bill crew to come back in and take over our policing again, despite the fact that over the last four years in the Trump administration, I don't care what anybody wants to say, I'm not partisan, I don't give a shit about left or So in the last four years, Police shootings and killings of American citizens went from 1,400 a year to less than 1,000. Mm. That's, if you factor in population increase, this is over a 50% reduction in police killings. Wow. That's crazy, mind-blowing su success. Mm. If your goal is to uh, reduce the amount of people that police kill. Mm -hmm. um, there hasn't been policy or procedure that have done this. This has largely been a cultural issue. But the bottom line is that this is what transpired. And now we're going back to this world where the people that I started fighting, Black Lives Matter, started on the Obama administration. The uh, Obama administration and Eric Holder and everyone else that was involved handed down the police policies that everyone has a problem with me enacting. I'm not the one that ordered them. They are. And now, as in the middle of having the success, we're going backwards because it's these damn counterintuitive things yeah. are going to just keep getting us. I don't, I, I am very much in a place lost of, or maybe I, these things are just out of my professional purview. I'm here to answer questions about policing, but I cannot begin to have an understanding of the mass psychological issue surrounding policing. Yeah. Why was, do you have any reasons or like, what are some of the factors as to why the shootings went down? Was it more policing? No, I, I think, I think because there's two issues that, that, that take place predominantly. One, I, I can't discount that the, the, the narrative um, going around America about Black Lives Matter and police shootings and stuff, it gets into people's heads and it just yeah. makes them more aware. I, th I think, I think awareness certainly has a part to play in it. Um, but I also imagine that it comes from police being less aggressive. Uh, that, you know, flies in the face of the public narrative. But police are way less aggressive than they have been in the past. I watch videos where people are complaining, oh, the police are being excessive force there. And I'm just, the only thing throwing through my mind is, but God, thank God they didn't have a video camera of what I would have done in that situation because well, it would have been a hell of a, a lot worse than what this guy just did. Yeah. Uh, so... I think we're kind of we're kind of in a, a place where the narrative helped, but also police step back, and re police are the fourth cause, most prominent cause that I've investigated that of violence. I mean, police are the society's answer. It's it's the state violence. It's society's violence. It's the mm -hmm. violence we're saying is morally correct. So yep. you will have less violence when you have uh, a, a, that type of violence, when you have policing going in. I mean, that doesn't mean you're not going to have more of the other type of violence. I'm just, th this is just a fact that police, there's a certain amount of violence associated with policing. Mm -hmm. So when police pull back and become less aggressive, you're certainly going to have both as well. I don't necessarily have a problem with police stepping back and being less aggressive. I think we should be more detective oriented, investigatory, but I mean, those are just the the explanations that I see to why it has re been reduced. Yeah. And you know, one, one thing that I find really interesting, um, you know, as an outsider looking in, we, we got rid of all guns, uh, in the nineties after, a, after a, our worst massacre, um, essentially. And, uh, you know, my, my partner, and I used to live with a, with a police officer. And one thing that I found really interesting was talking to her about the, um, the, the counseling side to being a police officer and trying to, you know, calm people down, calm the situation down. So it doesn't lead to that violence. But I can't help but think when, when, when you hear these, these, these movements and activists talk about defunding the police and to, to your point, it's so counterintuitive because you, you know what they're saying, but the idea 
for what they actually want or what is going to be better for society is actually in, at least the way I would see it is more funding so that there's better training. So these people are like all black belts in um, martial arts and, and really understand what they're doing. So they're not going to react so emotionally and get triggered by people that actually are triggered and traumatized, like exactly what you said. But one of the things to just to give the devil is do, I suppose that, that we might not understand at least to the significance in Australia is that, police in America are time and time again coming up to people that may or may not have a gun because it's mm-hmm. just so, it's so real there. So, you know, you know, I'm not saying police brutality, no one's saying police brutality is, is, is good. I mean, we need more of that, but you can understand how people out there with, with uh, without the proper training are going to react more emotionally because, you know, there is a, a real chance that someone might have a gun. Yeah, I mean, that's a certainly a primary reason why we talk about why are American police a center of this kind of topic? Well, for one, I think the biggest issue is correlated to that, and that is that liberties come at a cost, and a lot of the cost of liberties is in violence. And one of the liberties here is that pretty much a cop has to be considered uh, reasonably that any person they interact with could be armed uh, with a handgun. Uh, very easily. I don't care about assault rifles and shotguns and things like that. They're just not really using crime. Um, it's like 85% of street homicides are handguns. So yeah. I'm very much focused on the handguns and that fear aspect that handguns create. It's very easy to see somebody with a big rifle or a shotgun across their, their back. It's, it's obvious and it kind of sets the scene. But I think there's a fear element that comes from society as a whole that everyone being armed roots in. Now that's a bit of liberty. And those are discussions I, I think are largely out of my purview. I just like to explain these things. I think it's up to you how you want police to be and what kind of rules you want in society. Mm. But you're right, as long as those weapons are there, there are going to be more police killings and more police violence in the place where, where the officer is reasonable to think that his life is a trigger pull away. And, and that, that is true here. I don't want to get other cops afraid in other countries because they're subject to it as well. Mm. But I don't think it's, it's, it's possibly true. The odds aren't as high anywhere else than they are here. Mm. Uh, Another issue you brought up was the psychology. I'm actually, at this point, I don't think training is, I'm all for training and experience and creating muscle memories and stuff, but I don't think it works on everybody. Mm. Um, From what I've noticed and looking all around is there appears to be a biological issue. Um, People... It's, it's in their DNA, and maybe some of their life experiences do influence this, but some people either fight, they flight, or they freeze. And that's the vast majority of people. I think over, you're talking 95% of the people were either fight, flight, or freeze, and whenever they're faced with a, a deadly or dangerous situation. And all three of those responses are very poor responses for a police officer to take. I think there's a very small percentage of people who don't have the biological reaction of fight, flight, or freeze, and thus they stay clear-headed and can can survive and make rational decisions and training-based decisions in those environments. Um, An example of how this pulls out counterintuitively is we like to think that maybe you would put police or cops in schools to stop school shootings, but the number one thing that stops school shootings is an unarmed teacher physically disabling the gunman with their bare hands. And that is not because they've had some kind of training. That is because that individual biologically does not fight, flight, or freeze. They went into a clear-headed situation because when it's just fight, that's like berserker fight. It's not logical, thought-out fight. You have to think about what you're going to do to disarm somebody and not hurt them as well. That's literally the most common reaction to a school shooting is an unarmed teacher physically disarms the kid, then detains the shooter for the police to arrive. And that that, that highly signals to me that we are talking about some kind of biological reaction in people, not necessarily something you can train. Mm. So what, what would be your, uh, I'm sure you, you would have thought about potential solutions. If we're going to like separate the wheat from the chaff here and w- w- would you want, um, want it to be harder essentially for people to become police officers so we can find that 5% who, who aren't going to have those emotional reactions? 
Um, I, I think, so largely these are your decisions. I always want to point that. This is only my opinion when we get into these things. Uh, totally. um, but to be effectual, you would actually need to figure out this DNA code and you would want to test people. <laughs> Yes. Now, morally, and uh, I don't know what word it is, but intuitively, remember, these things are supposed to be counterintuitive, but intuitively, I'm saying, I don't know if I want to go into this realm where we are biologically testing people. So what the Marine Corps and any, I mean, any military does, any high stress environment, they put these people through intense training. And we kind of have this concept that they're being trained. But it's not actually true, and that's not actually what the military says. They will put you through these hard things, and then they're saying something to you like, well, seeing if you have what it takes. Mm -hmm. They're not testing to see if they taught you what it takes. Mm -hmm. They're putting you through challenges to see if you have what it takes. So I think we can probably do a fairly good job at inducing safe stress situations that can reveal whether people have a fight, flight, or fear response or not. Um, I always thought I was really weird because like stressful situations would happen at work and I would chase a guy down an alley and with a gun and make that arrest and figure it out and have my life within a breath. And then I would hop into the car and I just go to some other call about a burglary. And I, I, I totally forgot about my life being just narrowly surviving in a dark alley in the middle of fucking West Baltimore. I just moved on. And, yeah. and I have to think that that is because I just don't biologically respond the way most people do. Uh, I mean, and that's not a slight, I mean, it probably makes me a bad person all in all, but it makes me a good cop. Exactly. So, and uh, <laughs> I think you, you not that you're a bad people, person. You're a good cop. <laughs> I'm not totally bad. settled. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I really think there are ways to figure that out and keep people like me. I mean, look, hostage situations happened. Domestic violence things happen. People go crazy and you need someone to come in there as a representative of the community, essentially absorb the trauma that the community is not willing to absorb to do the violence that they're not willing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, stand on that wall and bang some heads from time to time. Somebody like me has no problem doing that. Enjoy it, as a matter of fact. But am I who you should be sending to pull cars over for traffic violations? Am I who you want to send to a family dispute? Am I who you want to send because somebody cashed a $20 counterfeit bill? Probably not. I think those kind of things are something more like special traffic agents or parking uh, meter maids. I mean, meter maids aren't generally killed or have somebody coming after them because they wrote a ticket. And I would assume that that's because that person doesn't actually pose a threat to the liberty of whoever they're trying to give a violation to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think you're gonna reduce things. That won't be perfect, but I mean, it's pretty clear to me that there will, there will be less uh, car chases, there'll be less sudden situations, and, and professionals who are very good at controlling high stress situations. Um, we view any death or any injury, whether it's our person or the suspect, those are considered failures in special tactics kind of communities. So, I mean, we enjoy these things. We enjoy banging heads. I used to always joke that for drug dealing, did I want the drug dealer to get a, a bad sentence? No, how could we play this game again tomorrow? If you're in jail, I don't understand. <laughs> we, I come to work, I chase you, you run, and then yeah, like a couple weeks later, we do it all over again. This is the game we're playing. I mean, is anyone unaware of cops and robbers? We're still playing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I don't want you hurt. I want to be able to. Ch I want to chase you again. I don't want you injured. So, um, th there are a type of people in a type of community that you need to stand on the wall and kick shit when that time comes. I just think you got to do something to separate us. I think SWAT teams should be constantly patrolling. You should have a high, highly militarized units that are ready to respond when things kick off, but we are reserved entirely for those things, not for getting arrests, not for writing reports. You sit us in the corner and you break glass in case of emergency and that's it. Mm -hmm. But you could also argue that someone like you with your personality and temperament is going to be 
just as, if not more effective in those lower stress situations, because you're so I'm going to be so bored. I quit. This is that. Well, exactly. Okay. So you, <laughs> altruistic, right? <laughs> you're so bored. Totally, totally. But I, I can't imagine that anyone who is kicking off a little bit, you know, in any way, shape or form is going to have any capability of overthrowing you or you like, I, you, I just can't see anyone like you reacting in, in, in a way that would make those activists say, Oh, police brutality. So it, it just won't even bother you. It'll be like, you know, flicking a fly off your elbow. Yeah. I mean, people would certainly have said that at work. I joke with some of my old partners, some of my old partners get caught up in the media thing right now. And they're like, Oh, policing has changed. And I'm like, bro, come on. If right now we were back on the streets and that dude talked to us that way, what would happen? <laughs> you know, like, I mean, that's just the way it is. And those, those, those type of issues that there are certain environments where these things go on. And I don't even want to say that it's always the best decision but if you think that the grandmother that has called the police 20 times to get those kids off the goddamn corner isn't happy when I come and bang those kids' heads against the wall and kick them off that corner, you're wrong. You're just wrong. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a lot of what we do is actually wanted by the community. That's why these activists aren't actual community members. So do you think that one of the reasons why people are having so many issues with police in general in the U S now is because it's so much more obvious what, uh, what policing actually entails. Like, I think you said you grew up in the nineties, um, you know, that, that real, that footage of the, the Rodney King, um, bashing and all that kind of stuff was the first time I think people really saw. And I was actually, can was you year. imagine that now? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I couldn't imagine a beating that obvious. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It, people would just kick right. off. Absolutely. Good. And rightly so you can't do that to someone when, the- I mean, you watch the Rodney King video and I mean, I think every human being is like, bro, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Totally, totally, exactly right. But yeah, no, I, I think, do you, do you think is a question, one of the reasons why people are really struggling with this is because of what, that people are now actually seeing what police do. And, you know, this is stuff that's a part of the job. This, you know, the reason why we have police to deal with those issues is so that the rest of society can function. And I would even say live ignorantly, you know, because, uh, totally. you know, just, I just, get up. I press a button when I'm hungry and pizza arrives at my door, man, you know, but people uh, that are in these law enforcement jobs uh, are having to deal with people that are causing them absolute nightmare and stress. Do you think it's just an issue now that it, we're so much more aware of it? I struggle with that. Um, I think we, there was a moment where we became more aware of things. So that we were talking about killings like Philando Castile, who did nothing. Um, Michael Slagler killing, oh God, I can't even remember his name, North Carolina, total obvious murder case. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like the videos of murder, it, you know, okay, let's put it this way. Anytime you have like a complaint and that complaint starts to go away, the definition of what that complaint entails grows. Mm -hmm. So now we've gotten to this point where I think we were looking at cases of like essentially clear cut murder. And we were saying, this is bad, but now we're looking at cases that are like, "Uh, I don't know. I mean, he was chasing the cop with a knife. Uh, What the hell could the cop possibly have done? Uh, Mm -hmm other than shoot somebody i'm confused so we seem to be finding cases the 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 dev as police get better in this five four or five year period the the the, what is being complained about the definition has grown to a point of ridiculousness that um i i can't discern what it is i i really just want to say that it's people actually wanting to just bitch and not actually do anything um, I don't think policing is bad enough that anyone will actually do something. Mm-hmm. They won't take a clipboard. They won't make the mechanisms for change. So basically, in America in the 1960s, there was a lot of protesting. And, and you can even go to, to L.A. like you did with Rodney King. Up, up until those points, we had a lot of uh, 
let's say residual problems that that were coming through things that were very obviously problems. And then as we began to improve and, and address those things, the mechanisms for change were put into place. When Martin Luther King did not fail, literally the mechanisms were put into place for any group of, of oppressed or impoverished people to band together and literally change their positioning. For example, the one I refer to all the time is very easy. In Buffalo, we talked to some activists they wanted to, to explain their policing was so bad. You know, sometimes I'm always like temper yourself. Your policing's not that bad. And, you know, it's like Portland's had like three police killings in, in four years or something like that. And they're like, oh, our policing is the worst. Like, come on. Like these could be statistical anomalies. You don't, you, you don't know what this is. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, what they would need there is 7,000 signatures. So the mechanism for any change to be put on a ballot with 7,000 signatures. And then obviously your mechanism there is in place and you have to have a majority of people vote for it and you can achieve anything you want. Mm -hmm. We would be told that this was impossible. Uh, we can never get 7,000 signatures. It took too much work. People didn't have time to collect them. But the very next day, they would go to a protest with over 20,000 people marching down the streets, nary a clipboard in sight. Mm -hmm. So um, I really don't believe any of the activists have any interest in actually reforming the ones that get involved and the ones that speak up are the the people who are pursuing power and they're using it as an excuse and a reason why they need power because they're black or they're a minority they need to be the ones in control i got news for you minorities have been in control of policing for a very long time in, in most of these areas um so so that it's really just been a power quest not a solution to actually change. I think I see policing as a much worse thing and can explain it than they actually do. They just see a few anecdotal accounts, give it as a justification of why they can lash out mm -hmm. and then not actually do anything about it. I mean, I think any real activist should have a defeating purpose. I wish that one day no one would ever have to ask me a question. And if you are an activist in a city and your Instagram account is all based upon you having the ability to bitch and complain about the police, the moment you solve that issue with whatever idea you have and get your idea into place, no longer can you bitch and complain. And I really think that although that sounds like a negative approach that's totally what is happening in america today mm. and it's it's just so interesting because it's it almost sounds like you know when you were when you were labeled as a as a whistleblower you know for the baltimore police and all this kind of stuff and i remember you talking about systematic issues and all this kind of thing what what has happened what's transpired in in the past four years certainly doesn't sound like anything you would have forced. No, I mean, you just said it. We were talking about systemic issues, institutional yeah. issues. These are things that are the echoes of policy and time and legacy. Now we went from being the system of policing has racist outcomes, which it does, mm -hmm. to the cops themselves are racist. And that is simply not true. And it's rather irrelevant that the cop is racist. Give me a whole police department of racists. If they don't do racist shit, I don't care. Yeah. This is my thing that I'm talking about. One thing that I've realized is, is that these unequal outcomes where we talk about, so police respond to violence, to sum it up quickly, uh, a lot of violence is committed by a small minority of black males. Black people live around black people. So police respond to violence. They're paid to catch crimes. So they're looking for violence like murder and shootings. When they don't see any, they see a jaywalker. They see a drug dealer. Drugs are tied to, to violence and, and the theory. So you lock, you lock up and you, you take enforcement measures against the people you're around. So innocent black people who are nonviolent essentially get double victimized because cops are looking for violent black men who are very likely to victimize those individuals as well. And then in the police pursuit of those violent black males, they catch up all of the other innocent uh, nonviolent black people in those neighborhoods. Mm. Uh, that is the basic explanation of why uh, policing is systemically biased. It has absolutely nothing to do 
with why, with, with a cop being racist or not racist. What I was doing had a racist outcome. I had zero racial intent. I don't give a shit who you are. White, black, brown, indifferent. My job is to put your ass in jail, and I didn't care who you were. You were a stat to me. There's no white stat, no black stat, no, <laughs> nothing. You're a stat. You're going to prison, and I look good for it. <laughs> I, I didn't care about that. But... I ended like 85, 90% of my arrests are black males mm. and they're not all for murder. You know, there's only a handful for actual serious offenses like that. The rest are, are drug dealing and uh, carrying a gun, which you could say, well, carrying a gun is an issue. Yeah. But when you're a drug dealer, not carrying a gun or having a gun near you is a pretty risky ass thing to do. Mm. Uh, uh, drug dealers are hunted by the police hunted by people who rob drug dealers and hunted by other drug dealers. And the drug users are ready to rip them off in a heartbeat as well. It's a very dangerous job. Uh, so I understand why they have guns and stuff on them. I, I get all this, this cycle. But I'm not racist, and neither are the cops around me, regardless of the outcomes. So we... I bitched about this a lot in the past. When you focus on individuals, it's like standing in front of a forest and you're just focusing on the trees mm -hmm. and you're totally missing the big picture. Totally. But so when did that, when did, when did that change from systematic racism, which as you just explained really well, you can have a conversation about and, and you can almost separate the individual, you know, it, it's like when the word systematic is there prefacing whatever the word comes after, there's that separation of, Oh, okay. So like I'm, I'm, I'm in this system, just like in a capitalist system, there's going to be inequalities and, and people are going right. to end up at the bottom. That doesn't mean I'm on purpose oppressing those people and shoving them down. You know, it's, <laughs> when you're talking about a system, it's exactly as you said, when did that become about the individual police officers? I, I don't, it just seems so irrational. Like I just trying to like find out when that became like, Oh, okay. No, specifically those people, you know, like Michael Wood from so-and-so it's like, what? Right. Um, there, I mean, I don't know how much cancel culture is a thing down in Australia, but it seems very much tied to culture, the cancel culture where if somebody does something wrong, you just kind of, ostracize those people and make sure they never work again. Like that somehow solves the problem. I mean, one of my big objections to the whole argument is that we're supposed to be hunting for justice. Justice is not vengeance. Justice is not taking somebody's job away. Justice for Tamir Rice, he's a 12 year old boy who was shot and killed by the police. The justice for him is not even firing, I mean, firing the cops is necessary, but it's not even putting that cop in prison. It's not firing that cop. It's creating a situation where the next Tamir Rice does not get shot. It is not keeping the exact same system. And literally, the odds are, I mean, this is like what I say about, they say good cops quit. And that's why I say there's such a thing as a good cop. I mean, I wouldn't even say I was a good cop. I'm just a necessary evil. Um, you're not going to be good in that environment because of what that thing is. Mm -hmm. So you have to, as a society, create the things to, to prevent that from happening again. What can we do to make sure Tamir isn't killed again? It isn't fire me if I did it, because odds are you're going to get a worse person to replace me. Every time you fire somebody like me, you lower the standard of people who are even willing to do the job. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's putting a band aid on a, on a snapped artery or, or something. It's just, yeah, I would say it's stabbing a wound. It's not even putting a, you know, it's, it's, it's like the, my key thing is that individual vengeance is understandable. And if it, I don't, I think it's a mitigating circumstance, mm. but society cannot base policy off of individual vengeance. Mm -hmm. That is the, the wildest thing that I could ever, I mean, and, and it, it, bec it becomes very clear that the, the people in general who are complaining about things don't actually have a principled belief in the things that they're complaining about because a lot of the solutions are right at the fingertips and they don't actually want to stop those things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, yeah, it, it is a, a individual vengeance is a descent back into tribalism. It's an eye for an eye. Right you don't want what, you know, there's a reason why democracy is so unbelievably profound because it's the exception. It's not the norm to, to think that we're a whole, we're monkeys wearing shoes. And like, I have to seriously just, argue about that democracy argument, but. Oh going. yeah, we can go. Yeah, for sure. But it's just like, it's, it's, we can, the fact that we are 
chimps essentially, but we can get along and have conversations and, and love is like, and not just go crazy all the time, you know, is, un, is unbelievable. We, we have a, um, you know, we, we, we have a, a cancel culture thing. I think it's a global thing really. And, and I, and that pisses me off so much, dude, because it's just, we're never going to, we're never going to get anywhere without more speech. Like if I, if I don't, if I don't agree with you, that doesn't mean that you're inherently wrong and I need to get rid of you. I need to understand why, because I can actually learn something. You know, obviously I'm saying some, some very obvious things here, but it, it <laughs> triggers me. <laughs> it feels obvious, right? Totally. But it doesn't seem like it's obvious. Like, yeah, I feel like talking to you, we're like, yeah, duh. Yeah. But I feel like we can find 10 other people pull them randomly off the street and say that too. And they would like a significant portion of them would argue with us. And it would just, mm. it would be mind blowing. Like, I don't understand what you're arguing again. Mm, mm, exactly. But they don't want to, you know, and <clears throat> you think maybe it's different here in Australia than it is in the U S but do you think that there is a big thing called cancel culture or is it just because it's so much, the people that are operating in those areas are so much louder than perhaps the people that are much more kind of centered. Cause I, I have a feeling like cancel culture is it's massive and there, and yes. there are issues <laughs> going on. Well, I know it's real for sure because, I mean, people have been trying to cancel me for the last two or three years. And, I mean, essentially they've done it effectively. I'm not a talk discussion point on the left anymore. Yeah, yeah. But on what grounds? Why would they be trying to cancel you? Oh, ACAB. ACAB. Oh, of course. Yes. I only recently found out what that was, actually. I mean, how, how can something be so simply blind? Yeah, all. All freaks me out. Right. And so what's your replacement? I mean, they, the whole thing is always uh, the replacement is just a smaller, less organized mm. police force. You think that your, your ragtag bunch of community members are going to handle a use of force situation better than professional police. Even our crappy ones are going to handle it a hell of a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. Th this is that, this is that real, this is that need for rationality and realism in a, in a utopian society. There'd be no such thing as police. There'd be no <laughs> such thing as government. But unfortunately, and that's the goal. Which that's the goal. <laughs> just remember, though, that is the goal. It's just not an achievable goal. Mm -hmm. Right. So you always work towards it. Like we want to work towards being a perfect parent. Yeah. But is there such thing as a perfect parent? Of course not. It doesn't mean you don't do your best to keep trying to strive for what that goal is there. But I have to go back. We can bitch about cancel culture, but I have to go back and just I, I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't uh, object to democracy. Talk to me. So Talk to me. Let's I hate it. democracy. I think democracy no is very foolish. Um, so democracy would say that because 99.9% .9 of the people disagree with me about policing, they should do it their way. Mm. Um, if there was a dictator of policing, you would want it to be me. You would not want it to be a popular vote. Um, so republics are actually the system of of equal of equity. Um, so is the electoral college. Um, these are points on the left where I say the left is completely unprincipled. Uh, democracy means majority rules. Mm -hmm. So that's literally a logical fallacy. The argument for popularity, um, the, the mob is very stupid. Individuals are smart, but mobs are very, very dumb. Uh, Galileo died in house arrest because the vast majority of the world uh, believed that we were not revolving around the sun, that there was gods running the, the world. Um, so that's just a quick example of why democracy is, is not very effective. Mm -hmm. um, the other example is uh, we're used, there's two great societies. The two great societies that have existed was the first republic, and that was Rome. And the second greatest society that has been existent in existence is the second republic, and that's America. America is a republic. It is not a democracy. And that is so that the weak have a voice. The reason why you have constitution and you lean on representatives is because the constitution is the thing that protects the minority. Um, voting for what is best for the majority literally opens the door for underclasses and slavery and things like that, because then we start having the moral belief in what is the good for the most of us, not as what is good for the weakest of us. And I think those are very uh, different moral places that you're coming from. 
um, uh, the Electoral College. The reason, I mean, we bitch, you hear the left bitch about that in America all the time because uh, the popular, the most people don't uh, determine who the president is in the United States. Yes, because the mass majority of people live in these cities and have no idea how to even feed themselves. But in these royal farmlands, they need a bigger say about what things happen in this country because they're literally more important and they're the minority. They are given a bigger voice to create balance. That's literally what the left in America claims to be about is creating systems where those without a voice get a bigger voice. Well, I got news, the people in literal what is called flyover country in America need a bigger voice. The joke is how they're ignored. Mm. I like that's really, I'd never really, so can you give me another, so the, a Republic, so the, the main difference between a democracy. A Republic relies on a law, a constitution, yeah. a document that's ironed in to say, this is what we will do. We will rely on the communal ethics that we have decided at this point will be good for the weakest among us. Not when we get strong, do we crush our opponents. We, we, we take the weak as equals at all times. All people are created in an equal, not just, not just those who are, are in the majority opinion. Mm. Okay. So do you think then that if, if so a Republic is created and predicated on a constitution, this is the way it is. This is why it needs to be. Do you think that does also though potentially set you up for um, stagnation and, and an inability to kind of revolve with the times? Sure. That's why you got to have amendments though. Yeah. Uh, so, so there is that, that thing, but that bar needs to be very, very high. It can't just be a majority. It needs to be a vast majority that are coming in to do something. And what you have, what you're doing has to fall in line with the original principles before. So we have like something like 30 amendments almost already to our constitution. And many of them I would argue with weakened it and made it worse than what it was before. I mean, I would say, uh, we have stepped back dramatically in liberties from the original constitution. Um, I, my book, Crimes and Punishments, it lays out uh, a lot of the, the, the opening chapter talks about how, I mean, I, I would say two thirds of the things that we would mostly agree with in the original constitution have been taken out and aren't followed anymore. And these were like basic principles such as, uh, you know, everybody having an equal right to legal representation, um, that, like voting rights and, and gun rights, obviously. I mean, I'm a person that argues for gun control, but not in a way that would violate the Constitution. The Constitution does not protect the, manu the right to manufacture weapons. Sorry, it doesn't. It, <laughs> it protects the right to bear them. So mm -hmm. I can easily just regulate manufacturing and I can control guns. Sorry, it doesn't break the Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, so th there are things like that that, that I would disagree with. But because I disagree with it, it's largely irrelevant. I, I think those people spent a lot more time, those elites in society, elites need to run society because we have specialized society. It becomes mm -hmm. literally more and more true now. Um, like, I can't expect a lay person to understand policing. I've dedicated my entire life to understanding this complex thing. The idea that I would expect you to understand what I expect of what I understand about policing is, is kind of ridiculous. You, you need to rely on professionals, whether it's, you know, who fixes your computer or who fixes your car, you know, a car, car maintenance is led by the elites of, of, car maintenance. I mean, I hate to say it, but that's literally the way it is. Society is run by the elites and it, it works out better. I'm not saying it works out perfect. It just works out better. That's why I'll defend capitalism. Um, it, but it come, as you alluded to, capitalism comes with a serious problem and that is dramatic inequality. And with dramatic inequality, that is the third correlate to, to violence. Um, it's often, sometimes it's the second, depends where you are, but in, in America right now, it, it, it's probably the second. Uh, it, the strongest correlate to actual violence is inequality. That's why it's not poverty. Poverty is no correlation to violence. It's when you see someone else has so, a much greater access to resources right in front of your face. You know, like, if, if, for me, for instance, I, where I live, there's not a lot of rich people. It's a middle-class neighborhood. But when I go over to Scottsdale and I see Acura NSXs and I see, I see fancy BMWs and Porsches everywhere, 
part of me is still like f these people you know like, oh, that's <laughs> my time. and that's that, that that is something that comes with uh with a, a capitalism but the bottom line is that the poorest of america are still the world's top one percent mm -hmm. capitalism lifts the weakest higher than any other system lifts the weakest. The problem is, is that it lifts the rich to be even richer disproportionately. And that causes a problem that just sits wrong with us as human beings. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, are we trying to create healthy poor people? I mean, the argument is very simple. In America, Dude, the homeless people here in Phoenix, they live in great weather, they have access to health care, they have shelter, they have water, they have food. I mean, they're, they're living a life that pe most people in, in, in third world countries would envy. You know, I lived in L.A. I mean, there's homeless people living on the beach in Malibu. I mean, <laughs> like, like these are the people dream to be in these areas. I really think that's a, a common thread in policing. I think or in America, I think one reason why you see so much complaining and cancel culturing and shit, because the definition of what you're going to bitch about has grown so dramatically that it, it, it's really gone to be nonsensical. I, I had a discussion with Daryl Davis, who was a great guy a couple of days ago. He's, he, he went, he's famous for going through and being the black guy that befriended all these KKK people, oh, got nice. them to, wow. to disown, cool. disown the KKK. Very great story. Uh, but these definitions to him, when I was talking to him, the definition of white supremacy and KKK actions has extended to a, a white person in Charlottesville, Virginia, killing another white person four freaking years ago mm -hmm. um, and um, a white kid protecting a, a gas station in Kenosha for a very obvious self-defense scenario, a white kid killing two other white people and injuring a third white person is the standard of KKK and white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And the police who are led by all black people in a black city that's all Democrats with black police officers is racist. Like, these definitions have expanded to the point where they're meaningless. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is something that... I'm trying to think if worry is uh, too strong, but it is kind of worry because. Uh, yes, it's worrying. Go worrying. with it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll finish it off there. <laughs> but it's worrying because we can't, you know, we can't have, look, you and I basically just had a, you know, a, a conversation about democracy there before. And, and it was important for me to realize what a Republic was. Um, that even that, is too contentious. And it's like, no, I don't want to hear it. Fuck you, man. You're off the show. You know, <laughs> totally. we, we, can't, we can't like, it's important for me to practice humility there because I didn't even know the definition of Republic. I can come to my own decision about what democracy is better and whatever it's for. And that's fine that I can do that on my own time, but to at least be humble enough to move away from the extreme so that we can all move forward. And uh, it, it worries me that when we're, when we're starting to use the word racism, you know, so much, it's so available and it's out there so much, it becomes meaningless. And the worst thing about that is that it actually, it actually uh, undermines genuine racist issues. Yep. Yeah, that, that, that's, I was, that, that was going to be the next thing that I said if you didn't say it. I mean, what that does is diminish, it's the boy who cried wolf, which yeah. diminishes the actual time the wolf shows up. Yeah. Everyone stops the care. And I, I, like, I, I think I feel that happening to me often, where it's like now I've, I've seen police violence. I, I know what police violence is. And when you're coming to me telling me, you know, it's, it's this minor thing that I saw in the latest video, man, I, I'm like, yeah, whatever. And I start to tune out. Mm. So how many other people start to tune out when it becomes that way? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're a, you're a fascinating example, man, because you know, what, what you initially started speaking out about has been lost in the, in, in the cloud of crazy talk. <laughs> yeah. It's very frustrating and upsetting and kind of confusing for me. I don't, I don't have a path. That's why we were joking earlier about 
I mean, I, essentially doing videography for my wife's photography company, yeah. Maywood Photography, M-A-E-W-O-O-D. we we'll put it in the description, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> is, is really like where I've been spending my time. I'm an FAA certified drone pilot now and <laughs> fly around doing those kind of things. And I'm not putting myself on a pedestal. But I do know that there are no other scholars who are approaching this topic in the way that I do. Mm. And I also know there are no other cops who are willing to face any opponent verbally. I should be places talking and debating and arguing, but there's no interest in it. Why do you think that is? Is it, is it be back to that cancel culture? People don't want to hear from you. It's because I'm going to make you look dumb. <laughs> you made me look dumb for a second there. <laughs> <laughs> Because it means I fucking learned something. Well, I mean, for better or for worse, I'm very focused on just relaying information. Mm -hmm. um, I went through for my dissertation, my, my PhD dissertation was really cool. I did a, a big study doing a thematic analysis of these interviews I did with Academy commanders and stuff. I use my, my police access to get to this group of participants that's never been accessed before. And I wanted to dig into them on why there, there is training that takes place in the academies that we know makes people more moral, but yet in police academies, they come out less moral than when they go in. So we have two things. We have tests that measure morality very effectively. And we applied those things to policing. And this was in England, actually. So it's policing is a little bit better than ours when it comes to certain issues, for sure. So these guys during training were being measured at one morality level. Then they went to the police academy and they got tra excuse me, training. And that training, we know, works in every other field when, it, when it's applied. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, in policing, we, we, it has the exact opposite effect. They come out of all this training with, with less sense of morality than they went into the police academy. So I start this training and I start asking questions. And the whole point is to like not ask them directly. It's kind of like you beat around the bush and then read between the lines. I thought for sure what we were going to discover is that, oh, policing culture has this issue and that issue. And the culture overwhelms the, the training. It right. seemed to be completely mm -hmm. logical to me. The real core that got revealed in this study was a difference between communal ethics and individual ethics. And the terms are being used interchangeably throughout the law and throughout police policy and organizational policy and even people themselves. So what I mean by this is uh, if you, the law says in America that if a police officer is in fear of his life or the life of others, that he can use deadly force in that scenario. And the key part there is feel. If he individually feels that taking another person's life is what is necessary, then that is the legal justification. So that is completely based on individual ethics. You're trusting that this person is making the best decision humanly possible, and we're going to use that as justification to whether or not they were going to kill a person. Now, I would argue, and the, the basic concept of the law argues that morality is judged by the community, not by what an individual believes. So the police officer, in this case with communal ethics, should be doing what the community expects of them. Yep. Now, we're going around the policy and the police departments are saying, do what the community expects of you. The law is saying, doing what the individual thinks it expects of you. Then culturally, if a, if a cop kills somebody and there was a reasonable belief, well, then all the cops are going to stand up and pro-cop and pro -cop supporters are going to say that there is obvious if you were in these shoes, you would have done that too. Well, that's freaking irrelevant to what you would do in those shoes. This is an employee that needs to follow communal ethics, the steps that are determined by the community. Wow. Where we get a big hang up is, is that means the blame is on the community as well. Mm. And with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. And I don't think that people want to actually take up the responsibility and that police themselves are, are taking up 
which is the making of this decision. So if it's Derek Chauvin killing George Floyd, and the evidence is extremely clear that the training and positioning that Derek Chauvin was using on George Floyd is the training they got in the Minneapolis Police Department. That means that Derek Chauvin does not get fired, is not criminally charged, because he literally did what you told him to do. And cops cannot be going around being rogue employees, basing moral decisions off of whatever they think. But all throughout the law and all throughout the policy and all throughout discussion, individual ethics and, and communal ethics are being used interchangeably mm -hmm. so that neither – like people will have individual ethics in one moment and then, and then communal ethics in the next moment, not realizing that these need to be essential principle. Shit, man. You just blew my mind with that. That's so interesting. That's so interesting is – yeah, because to me, morality is by definition interpersonal. It's do unto others. It's not, I mean, I mean, you could argue that I'm, you know, if I have personal, but then I think, yeah, I think that the difference between what I was about. Right, to but say, I'm not an individual as a cop. True. Right. So this is always fine in the individual circumstance. Mm -hmm. So do you go is it moral for you to kill the person who raped your daughter? Mm. Probably. I'll go with you. I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. But can society say that is justified? Mm. No, no, not at all. Mm. You know, all murder is wrong, period. You know, we can mitigate your sentence because of those circumstances, but the community is going to expect and should expect that you behave according to the community, not according to what you think is right. That's where we get into a republic because we trust our representatives to do what they think is right. That's the first. That's the reason why you vote them in because they have more information than the rest of the person. But when you're talking about an employee killing and using the power on, on the streets, then they need to follow what their bosses say. They are employees. They're not representatives of the community they are employees so do you think then it's not so much about uh better training for the cops but it's actually more about this kind of reform stuff and looking at looking at these differences these slight differences between you know what's actually going to hold up in your court and, and and how we can better that mm -hmm. i think better training actually probably is more beneficial to the police themselves versus the community mm -hmm. um if, if there were certain policy changes like for instance just ending the drug war would be a policy change vastly more important than anything else that's, that that is taking place with any kind of training you give yeah. cops uh, the impact would be profound mm. uh, I, I i'd like to to argue this point all the time when i get into my gun debate questions um, so are handguns a huge problem in america yes but if you gave me the drug war and ended that I may change my position about handguns entirely because I think the data would change entirely that without the, the drug war, the percentage of, of, of shootings and, and violence would go down yeah. dramatically. Yeah, we, we, we could have a 10 hour discussion about the drug war, man. <laughs> that's actually that's actually what I uh, a part of what I actually do for work is talk about. Uh, drugs and and and, and the I mean, the opioid crisis going on in America as well. Since so the one of the issues that I have about the drug war as well is that when you force it underground, there's that thing called the Iron Law, and 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 all these cartels from the South, just speaking about. America and South America, but they're pushing harder doses of drugs in smaller, small, smaller amounts to get that same kind of that money back. And, um, yeah, ROI is important, baby. Yeah, Shipping's exactly. expensive. Exactly. Well, it just becomes a business, <laughs> doesn't it? It is a business. I mean, don't be fooled. Yeah. I mean, the reason black kids sell crack on the street is a business. It's not, it's, I mean, it's it's most, I mean, the number one rule of drug dealing is not use your product. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It's crazy. Why do you think, why do you think that's still taking such a long time to change? Well, actually we're starting to see some changes now, are we? This is what I'm saying though, about the pragmatic thing. If we yeah. stay the course and, and, and stay calm and don't chase people away, mm -hmm. it seems very clear that these changes do take place. So, uh, I, I wrote an article recently about this on medium. So I do write a lot on, on medium and do oh, YouTube sick. videos for anybody that wants to check those out. 
But one of the things I was talking about is uh, with, with the drugs right now, um, I live in Arizona, so we just went full cannabis legalization. I think seven states either went medical or, or full legalization this last election cycle. And Oregon went to total legalization yes, or decriminalization yeah. of every uh, of all drugs. Um, these, these will definitely make uh, improvements in all over these places. I, I always like to, t- you know, the, the two drug dealers who are, who are doing rival territories over their selling of weed will shoot each other. But I, I mean, the, the store down the street over there and the store down the street over there and the store down the street over there, they, they don't go out shooting each mm-hmm. other over who gets the most cannabis sales. It just it just doesn't happen. The benefits are, are quite obvious. Uh, so and, and even like believe it or not, once things are legalized, they ch- children use them less because I always think it loses the cool factor. I mean, I think weed is probably the, cannabis is probably the most uncool thing for my daughter. She's like, oh yeah, I want to go sit there and smoke a blunt like my dad's retarded friends. You know, like, she doesn't want to be like us. Right. So, so you have those kind of elements. I think that really change society. That, like, like you said, that don't really involve all these other issues. They don't involve demonizing anybody. You don't have to yeah. demonize anybody to end the drug war. You have to demonize them to support the drug war. So I, I think a lot of the things I bitch about are really just explaining, and people think I'm justifying or, or, or tilting that way, but I mean, a lot of it is just explaining how the actual system works now. And I can't I can give you opinions, but I'm not big on opinions. I can only give you what the data is saying. And I, I want you to be the ones that, that have those opinions about how things should change and what, what they should be. I'm just going to tell you what is going to happen, what counterintuitive thing will result from your decision. But, but you do them yourselves. I, I, you, re, you refer to me as a source of information, yeah. not as the decision maker. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, uh, yeah, in this day and age, it's becoming harder and harder to really have a decision because it's, you know, it seems like any decision or opinion is just braided out on all sides. Mm. And it's just like, fuck, why am I even doing this? You know, but which, which, which sucks. Cause I think it's important to, to listen to people like yourself that have been at ground zero and, 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 and really find out what the issues are. You know, thank you for, for speaking up, which is, it's a courageous thing to do, especially in this day and age. Um, and tell us, you know, the, the, the realistic circumstance so that we can have these kind of formulated opinions and things. And it's great, man. What do you think? I think at the beginning of the show, we were laughing about, you, know, you don't really know what the next six to 12 months is like for you, but do you have any kind of ideas on the horizons? Is it social media? Is it YouTube medium? What's, what's, what's up ahead? No, so I've been focusing a lot on trying to do more writing and making videos. So I probably put a new video up on YouTube at least every couple of days. Um, I was writing even more frequently than that, but I kind of peeled off a little bit. I'm starting to feel that I have to write more in scientific literature, mm-hmm. even though it's something that's not read and is very time consuming and will have pretty much zero reward that I need to do that more because my work is probably about getting the information available. I need to get things down so that they outlive me. And whenever society is ready, then the materials will be there. But I really can't, I I think I've, I've, I've spent some time in the past trying to influence whether society is ready or not. And I don't have that power, uh, nor, uh, skill. Mm. So, uh, you know, I think this thing we talked about Galileo earlier, I, you know, we didn't pick up on Galileo to hundreds, you know, sometimes thousands of years later on a lot of these principles, whether it's him or Da Vinci or space travel or anything like that kind of stuff. We often realize, you know, great artists are almost never appreciated while they're alive. Yeah. And if I'm the great artist of this topic, I have to accept that I'm not going to be appreciated while I'm alive and need to do the best I can to make these things be something that is, is more solid in the future from when people do refer to them. What are some of the things that you would hope listeners can appreciate from this conversation? Like two or three things. I think the most important thing for at least in America is, is that any of these changes you want to do are actually feasible. It's very easy to make these changes in, in Portland, uh, along with uh, Oregon decriminalizing drugs, 
they put in a ridiculous police reform policy that will have absolutely no chance of, of, of helping and will make things worse in Portland. But they got together and they did pass a ridiculous idea because somebody wanted to do it and they put forth the effort. It really only takes like one person to be truly committed to getting it. So like I said, with something with like 7,000 signatures, it only takes one person to be truly committed to this cause mm. and they can, they can accomplish these things. I don't do it because that's not me. The, I'm fine with policing. It doesn't bother me. Nobody's going to bother me. Um, I, I've had, I, I'm worried about being you know stopped in my car like anybody else. But I do everything I can extremely well to not uh, get pulled over. I, you know, maybe that's being a weenie and following all the rules. But I'm telling you in America, if you follow all the rules, the, the odds of the police messing with you are extremely low. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's just that's just reality. So I, it doesn't bother me enough that I give a damn. If a cop wants to go one on one in an alley, I'm probably comfortable with it. I get why you're not. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, been uh, doing jujitsu for ten months, so I've got another ten years before I feel comfortable with it. <laughs> okay, well that's understandable. Yeah. And, and and so I, I don't you know don't rely on me or or somebody else. These changes can all be done if especially if you just put in the work and you care to learn about elevating these ideas and to be principled. It's not about being the person who gets it done or gets credit for it. It's about the principle that stays in and will help everybody. We want to lift up all boats. Yeah. Uh, don't get caught in any tribalism. And, and that's really all I can say is the things not to do at this point in time. It's a weird thing about science. So let me leave this about science. Yeah, There is no such thing as scientific consensus. Go ahead and apply that to whatever topic you want to apply it to. I'm sure you got everybody's hinting at which one I'm applying it to, but there's no such thing as scientific consensus. Science is not a collection of things that are true. Science is a collection of things that are not true. It is only what does not work. It is never what does work. To find things that do work, you must forge into new territory. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, there's two things I wanted to add to that as well. Just first with that point, what's true, you know, is even a difficult thing to discern. The definition of what true, at least to me, is what's been measured to be the same across a long span of time. That's the best we can really go on. You know, Mm -hmm. there's so much we don't know about. We can broaden this conversation out to what we're doing here. How the fuck we got into this body? You know, I right. I'm talking in real time. I have no idea how this is working right now. Right. <laughs> I'm so dumb about so much, you know, so it's very hard to kind of find stable ground, which is even more worrying about what's going on in the extremes of cancel culture and everything. Because now if we can't agree on anything, what you said, which we don't want to happen is descending back into tribalism is, uh, is becoming more and more. I'm an optimist. I don't think it will happen, but it is a danger. Of course. Um, the other thing that I wanted to add from what people can appreciate from this conversation, at least in terms of what I took from it as well is recognizing context and, and, and the past and, 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 and the historical significance of ideas. And, you know, we live in a world now where the individual has never had this much power to access information, film things, you know, with phones and all. It's just insane. It's it, for better or for worse. For better or for worse, absolutely. <laughs> it's best of times, worst of times, you know. But I think we can forget often that the way systems are and 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 how society runs itself has been beaten and amended and and folded and you know, debated about over so long, it's worthwhile understanding how we got here so that we can make a better plan as to where we want to go, as opposed to just being like, you know what, the whole thing is shit. Let's just revolution. Let's be anarchists and go crazy. Yeah, totally agree with you. The first thing that you realize when you start to get educated is how little you know and will (laughs) ever know. Like, I mean, even with policing, I mean, this is my subject and I am still profoundly ignorant in the, all the things that causes human activity, why people commit crimes, what influences there are, you know, what the, the best ways to fix it. Like we literally have no idea how to fix it because no one's exploring ways to fix it. No one's putting in any test projects and we're not doing anything at all. So yeah, I mean, Start exploring, start forging out, start reaching into, into new things and don't be afraid to be wrong. Um, 
I, I watched a, let me just leave with this, this, this last thing. Mm -hmm. uh, for one, uh, another thing is I think any questions that people have uh, that listen to this, I love to get into any of those questions, even if they're all these weird things like my biological things or even the meaning of life, what people do. One of the weird things about my, uh, my research, my dissertation, I'll show you real quick. If I can find the graph is that I had to base it in some kind of philosophical principle. And that principle, I followed through the research and found this thing called constructivism, which mm -hmm. kind of explains how people react and handle situations regardless. It's like, it's like explaining the individual worldview. Why do people think this thing? Why do people think that thing? Mm -hmm. And I wish I could find, I'm going to find this graph here, but I ended up creating this graph and it really just, it puts into perspective what life is like, what humanity is. And it's, here we go. So, let's see, does it even work? Let me see. Oh, oh yeah, I can see that. Yep. Can you Every, see everyone that? who's listening is just going to have to jump on the YouTube channel and see this. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll put it, <laughs> we can put some links into it at the bottom. But essentially what happens is, is there's a, you're an individual and you're going about your world. You started off with DNA, and then you take this DNA into the world, and you get these experiences, and you add these experiences to the things that you know, your, your knowledge base. You compare them to the world's knowledge base, and then you integrate what that means. That knowledge goes in back into society. It melds with society, and then it creates and, and plays a part in the next experience that you will have. It changes you, and then you go into this thing again. Each experience just goes through this cycle of, of me, what is the meaning of this? What is this to me and my personal knowledge? What is, the, is, is happening out in the world with this knowledge? Those things blend together, creating an entirely new reality of, of the world whenever you've participated or even set a thought, you, you change that thing. An example of this is, is suicide. So in this individual worldview, kind of like who you are is this DNA plus this collection of experiences. And even the decisions that you make can only come best from this multiple choice list of things you've been presented with mm -hmm. throughout history. So if you never had a, uh, the idea of Jesus Christ being exposed to you, your idea of who the Son of God is could not be Jesus Christ unless someone else gave you an experience that puts that onto your multiple choice list. Yeah. So before we even judge somebody and the decisions that they're making, if we're saying we're not, they're not doing the, didn't make the best decision, we would have to first know that that decision was even on their multiple choice list of mm -hmm. options to do. So you go out, you create new information, and this thing comes back. But the beauty of this all is that it seems like, oh, well, what's the point then if I'm just my experiences? That's valid. But what this means is every action you do creates an experience for someone else that unavoidably fundamentally changes who that person is. Mm. And I, I, that gives a great meaning to the world. Our purpose in life is essentially to create beneficial experiences for the next person, mm. not ourselves. <sighs> That's awesome. And so I call it Neo-Kantian constructivism. But I'll pass up some stuff so you guys can all see what these things are. And so I'll, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time getting into the philosophies of these yeah. uh, concepts because I, I needed to find a philosophical grounding for even what I was talking about. If we're going to change policing, what is my philosophical grounding for reality mm -hmm. that this policing exists in? It, it, it's interesting. I was going to bring up Immanuel Kant and you said uh, Neo-Kantian in constructivism, because I think one of his uh, ideas was that you, you can't take away this, this perceptive filter. You know, I, I, when I was studying philosophy, I had a everything's really, an illusion. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Maya, totally. Um, I had a really tough time with uh, the objectivists and uh, mm -hmm. you know, the rationalists and all that kind of stuff, because even if there is some kind of objective reality, I can't perceive that. And it's unknowable to the human being. Completely, totally unknowable. 100% unknowable. So it's like, what do, like, 
there is an objective reality. It's just absolutely meaningless to our lives. Yeah, exactly. It's totally meaningless. And, uh, and I think when it comes to (laughs) morality and and all these kinds of things that you and I have spoken about, what's important is totally your point, how I relate to someone else, as opposed to finding out what's true. It's like, well, it's important for both, but maybe truth can also benefit the other as well. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And that's why I said, I think that if people have weird questions, there's like no such thing as too weird of a question when it comes to this topic, because we're essentially talking about what human beings do at that crux of where they're the worst. When they're at their, the, the, the cop is often responding, not in an optimal position to somebody who's at their temporary worst. Mm-hmm. And that, that is the, the probably the most serious intersection of where humans come across one another. Yeah. Yeah, man, we have to do another show about philosophy. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that that was my big thing. Right. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's a joke. Uh, I, I like to, to harken back. I, I think if you ever listen to yourself from two years ago, you should always think that what you said was moronic. Absolutely. And I, I seem to be completely trapped in this thing where I feel like sometimes what I said two months ago was completely moronic, even though it made a lot of sense at the time. <laughs> and I used to joke about philosophy and be like, oh, philosophy. Yeah, I was just going to sit here and think about it. Oh, you're a doctor of philosophy. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh, damn it. I'm essentially a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, yeah, man. Thank you so much. A um, uh, couple of months time, we'll reach out again. We'll, we'll go deep on uh, philosophy and psychology. That'd be awesome. He's great, there, brother. I'd love to do that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, is there anything you want to plug? Um, anything you want the listeners to know? No, the only thing that I really want people to do is share the YouTube videos. That's just me. You can Dr. Michael Wood. So just put Dr. Michael Wood in the YouTube and that'll come up right away. Or if you like to read things, I have my stuff. It's Michael, probably Michael A. Wood Jr. at Medium, but just Michael Wood Jr. Medium. And you'll, you'll, you'll come across my articles. Um, if hopefully they'll piss everybody off. I mean, that is, that is half of my point is to challenge a lot of our worldviews. Um, I think whether you are left, right, or you think you're independent, you will find something in there that <laughs> distracts you and argues with you. And one thing that we can talk about right now is there's a video I did on the Electoral College. I, I encourage everybody, and it's an article too, so you can do it either way, mm. To that explains why the Electoral College is really the best source of equity that we could that I could imagine or that has ever come up in the way that we vote. It is, it is truly... Uh, based on principles that should unite all libertarians, all liberals, and all conservatives. That they, they, it integrates all of their beliefs into a system uh, that that should be the compromise that everyone's willing to go with. Mm, awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely keen to check that out. I'll follow you on Medium as well, man. That sounds awesome. Uh, guys, thank you so much for listening. Uh, until next week, bye-bye. Hey, guys. If you enjoyed the content, Uh, You are more than welcome to click the link in the description below. That will take you right to a free webinar where I will be taking you exactly through how to design a framework for your life and create that mission that will bring about a sense of intrinsic value to you. Go for it.